Welcome back to the Lenten Rouge Cycling Podcast for our first ever weekly show. We've been wanting to do this for quite a while, not content with covering most of the world tour. We want to cover those smaller races or other races or other news throughout cycling that we've we've not had a format to do. We've maybe had to tack it in at the end of a, a race recap, but here we can do a recap of the Mallorcan races we've just watched, the Australian classics in Victoria, the races upcoming. We'll have short previews for Algarve or Valenciano or Bessege or Saudi Tour, about a million of them. We've got E3 yeah. sharing a homophobic cartoon. G's announcement of his, uh, what I think is a very surprising schedule. So much news to get into, wild cards. It's as I'm keen to do this, Benji, and this show is brought to you by Join Cycling. More on them in a second, one of our new partners. Uh, but yeah, what's, your, what's been the most shocking news, I guess, in cycling this, at the moment, Benji? For me, it actually was like the G's, <laughs> G's announcement that he was going to do two Grand Tours in a row. I think it's good that he announced that, but we'll get to that in a bit. But uh, there's been, just been a lot happening. It's like, Seasons kicked off again, a lot of racing, and it's also a lot of racing at the same time. So GP Marseillaise, while well, all the Mallorca challenges are happening, yeah. and then I'm then I'm trying to figure out where I can watch it because I'm still burning under the fallout of GCN Plus to the point that I'm not sure what's gonna be on Discovery Plus and what won't be. And eventually, I reckon I've been able to watch most of what cycling had to offer in the in the recent month. And yeah, there's been a few uh, debacles coming along, like the E3 thing, like Nibali bullying a uh, an Italian Zwift Academy member on Strava. Like, there's a lot happening in this sport. <laughs> yeah. First, we'll wrap up the Australian races. One of our fan favorites, or our, one of our favorites, rather. Not sure if he's a fan favorite. Lawrence Pithy won the small group sprint in the Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race. That's sort of, it's got a hilly climb about nine k's from the finish called Chalambra. Australia loves to have these like punchy suburban hills to side their races, and this race is no different. <laughs> and he was getting over that easily, actually, in the, in the front group, and then he nearly got boxed in and won the sprint ahead of uh, Nathaniel Tesfacion, who was very, very close, uh, the Eritrean on Little Trek, and uh, Jörg Zimmermann came third on Anton Marche. So Corbin Strong and Israel may be a little bit disappointed. I think they would have hoped for at least a podium with the, the strength of Williams and Corbin Strong. Yeah, I think so as well. And the thing with Strong as well is that this parkour is kind of made for him, like reducing the group and the way that the team Israel was trying to hold it together for him was also textbook. They were able to do so quite well, leading into a final sprint. But at the sprint, he just wasn't good enough. If he was stronger, he wasn't in a position that I thought he was completely boxed it in. But somehow he made his way through that group and he looked faster than everybody by like quite a bit. He dominantly won that sprint. And I vividly remember starting to follow this guy. I think it was 2022 in the New Zealand Cycle Classic. I didn't know that he had won the Baltic Chain Tour the year before, and I think a stage in there as well. But New, Z New Zealand Cycle Classic, that's the moment when I, when I was like, because for some reason, when the season starts, I kind of want to follow every race that exists, including like, a, what is it, a 2.1 race or something, a 2.2 race or something in, in New Zealand. I think Keegan Hor Hornblow or something won it into uh, 2022. I don't know why I remember that, but I I was really hoping that he would win a sprint that year. I think he did it in Normandy that year, and then the year after he obviously went to the to the World Tour team with Loire Atlantique and Cholet, where he was really good. Like those French smaller classics, he won one of the two. Can't remember which of the two. And now in 2024, like the way he was not only sprinting at Santos to the under, but also climbing on the uh, Mount Lofty stage where he was <laughs> near the front group, like. That shows not just sprinting, but versatile qualities, and it delivers in this race. Yeah, he seems to be taking a, a big step up. There's also other riders in New Yorker who I think might be this year as well, but yeah. Fifty is definitely one to watch out for. FTJ have started January uh, with a bang, but not just with points, but actually winning races. And a World Tour race before you even start the races in February is, is certainly a way to, uh, to start the season and, and get that stat sheet going. In the women's race, Cecilia Utrup Ludwig was the the best on on Chalambra. Gigante attacked first, but then uh, I think Utrup Ludwig is really 
maybe it's in terms of like pure puncher, maybe the best in the world, her and Lippert I see at the moment, or, or Vollering, uh, in terms of like a 20-second attack uphill. She mm -hmm. gapped everybody, but seemed to like put herself in the red because Dominika uh, Vl Vlodarczyk, I can't say it. How do you say her name? <laughs> I'd reckon it's Vlodarczyk and Rosita Reinhardt. They good. both bridged up to Uter Ludwig. But did you just forget to mention your, you're probably one of your favorite punchers, Kasia Niviadoma, or do you think that 20 seconds is too short for her? No, Ludwig, Ludwig on an uphill punch, 20 second uphill punch, quicker than her, yeah. So it's a kilometer, 8% cowbell she needs. Yeah. Yep. I'm not even sure that's remotely the, the percentage of the cowbell, but I just that sounds hard made for the that cowbell. up. <laughs> <laughs> It just made Amstel harder. Yeah. <laughs> That's the age. Um. <laughs> but anyway, we just said those two bridged up. Dominika of Lodarczyk, she was pretty close, I think, in, in Santos to the Under as well. Was yeah. pretty good there. Polish rider on UAE. And then Rosita Reinhardt was top 10, I think, at Santos to the Under. A Dutch rider on, on Visma Lisa bike. And it was quite interesting because I thought that group was going to just either get caught or sprint at the finish line and suddenly the camera pans to the front group and Rosita's off. Reinhardt is just with a gap on the others and I missed the attack. So I was like, is well, she, she going to make it? She was pulling much stronger than them and mm -hmm. Ludwig wasn't rolling through. So like Ludwig well, is like, Ludwig is Costa <laughs> and Valverde, right? In the women's race. So like yeah. she won't relay. Um, She's a pain in any chasing group or even in yeah. the leading group. Yeah, yeah that's what I mean. It's in the leading group. And then I think Vladarczyk Went for her to pull through. Reinhardt's pulled through really strong. Ludwig's let the wheel go. And then there's a gap. And so <laughs> Reinhardt like just went. And yeah. she's a small rider. I was like, this is gonna be tough to keep this uh keep this going and with the group chasing behind with also the duo uh Gigantes attacking from group now three on the road. So there's groups everywhere. Uh but Reinhardt manages to stay away. Uh, Ludwig and Vladarchi can't really cooperate. Uh, and yeah, she she wins a big race for Visma Lee Spike women's team yeah. and uh, for herself. And you know, 19 years old, winning on the attacking on the flat like that, I was uh, very surprised and super strong performance. So that was good to see young riders winning both races. Average age of about 20 20 years <laughs> old, winning both the Cadell Evans uh, races. There was also the uh, there's like a sprint classic, a one one in the week called the Surf Coast Classic, uh, where uh, Binny won the sprint ahead of Viviani and Wait. Corbin Strong. Caleb Ewan didn't uh, didn't come eleven. Top 10. I think he came eleventh or something. But is this the the race that was previously called Race Torque? Because I remember yeah, yeah, vaguely. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I I didn't know for sure if it was that, but hey, good win for by Binny. Uh, I don't know how how much I can place on it. I actually didn't see the final of that race, so I don't know if you. So specifically the sprint itself, whether he was in a better position or not, but I literally couldn't find where to watch it. Uh, it wasn't live broadcast. It was only oh, well. highlights, I think. <laughs> okay. So there you go. Yeah, <laughs> I'll give you a pass this time. Luke Plapp, uh, he raced both of those races. I'm not sure that was the best idea, uh, frankly, with uh, maybe bigger ambitions in a Grand Tour later in the year, but thankfully he didn't go down again uh, with that severe road rash. But he actually looked good. He, he and Tarling, Tarling particularly, but Plapp actually looked very good in Cadell Evans' road race. Um, yeah. Trying to bring Kel back, but it's, it's tough to win that. And it was his skill set unless you really go clear after Shalambra, like Simmons tried to do. And, and uh, it's tough on your own with Williams chasing on Israel behind. Uh, that's all the Australian races. Benji, how would you rate the Australian summer of cycling? Ooh, I like that the youngsters really showed out on top. I also yeah. enjoy that. Stephen Williams, maybe not the youngest rider, is also winning a race like that outside of the Arctic race of Norway's or whatever he wins throughout the season usually. So that's also a bit of a step up there. But I like youngsters winning, but it's also a forgettable Australian season for me personally. Yeah, no, like Richie Poor, Dominus. It was good to see Gigante back. I think the women's yeah. was was okay. Uh, I think the women's, uh, both Cadell's finals was was very, very exciting, particularly the women's. It's like a crit. I think it was yeah. Is that rude? Yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe. I, I think it was good to see not Ineos, Yumbo, or or um, or UA winning all the races. Yeah. 
it's just good to have different teams winning some world tour races as well to start the year. Sure. Maybe that'll change <laughs> in the upcoming month. Yeah, but uh, but yeah. There is light points though in riders on that team that you might not have expected to perform that well. As yeah, in Del, like Toro, Del Toro, obviously. Yeah. We expected him to perform at some point in his life because he was bloody talented. But to do it at the Lemon. first race already, Lemon at Visma, same thing. Vadra was maybe a bit disappointed in because I expected him to be leader, but Lemon was just better this race. So it's kind of the getting to know the maybe newer riders on the block, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's Australia. That's Australian cycling. My Australian summer of cycling is over as well. And I did that on the Join Cycling app. So the Join Cycling app, it's really big in the Netherlands and now they're going global. It's an adaptive training platform for you to get the most out of your cycling. You can use your power meter or heart rate as well with the Join Training tool and it's an adaptive training plan. So you insert or you have your training history, you insert your goals, you insert your weekly availability, and then you can change that daily availability. I'm not available to train today on the app, and it adjusts your training program on the fly immediately uh, and suggests workouts you have. But the best thing that I like about it is the flexibility because, like, I'll be frank with you, I am not going to do the exact 100% compliance <laughs> with the intervals of a training plan for four yeah. weeks. Straight, I'm not going to do that. Like I've, I've tried it before and I just can't do it. Riding outside as well, a fair bit, impossible. That's why I've, I've, I've used this for my post-COVID recovery training plan in the last month because there's a recovery training plan when you're getting back into fitness. That's really good because I like, like the low intensity but like higher volume of it. But that's aside, you can insert plan i got a group ride where I'm going to sort of sm an hour and a half of junk. That You can insert that into the app and then it adapts your training for the next days and your plan accordingly. Because for your like, mental enjoyment of cycling, yeah, I want to go ride an hour and a half of, of <laughs> yeah. junk with people outside. <laughs> um, that's part of enjoying cycling. And then the next day, you're back on the plan you need to do based on the ride that you just did. So the, the goalposts, the flexible goalposts guiding you in the right direction is what I love most about this app. And you can try it too. You can use our promotional link to access a free 30-day trial. You don't need to insert your credit card. I think that's a pretty generous trial period. 30-day free trial. And then Join will notify you seven days in advance that you're, you can then have a six-month subscription also at a discount. So all you need to do is download the Join Cycling app in the App Store or Play Store, open the app and sign in without selecting an in-app subscription, go to join.cc slash Lantern Rouge and enter the URL supplied in the show notes or scan the QR code to get 30 days of free training. So I'd encourage you to, to try it out, see if you enjoy it as much as me and report back. Uh, but yeah, I really enjoyed Join Cycling so far, and thanks to them for supporting the launch of our weekly show in particular. All right, men's Spanish 1-1 races and Mallorca challenges. Benji, these are the points farmers. So these are a series yeah. of races on Mallorca, in Mallorca or also in Valencia, a couple before, but basically they have like five 1-1s in a row, and the reason they're not a stage race is they allow you to sub in and out riders uh, each day depending on what, where they they don't want to race five days in a row. And it also means there's more points available. Uh, so do you want to speed run these, Benji? And I'll, I'll dip in yeah. with the ones I've watched. I'll speed run with the, the earliest ones. So the GP Valencia or Classica Comunitat Valenciana 1969. Apparently that's the name. Bruno Mejin won a sprint ahead of Kokar and Tim Torn Teutenberg. We spoke about Little Trek Future Racing Team that they have quite a few family members, but this is actually a really good family member because... <laughs> He's already sprinting to third on his first race of the season. Next one, GP Castellon, also known as the Ruta de la Ceramica. Machu is winning an uphill sprint ahead of uh, one of the Aja Desert boys that can actually pedal 1,000 watts, probably. Pierre Gautera, did you expect that? Yeah, I said him. Yeah, I said you did? Him. <laughs> I said, this guy can do 1,000 watts. You're, you're oh, right. Oh, by the way, join actually... cycling. 
it even adapts to my 1500 watts for 50 seconds. You think it wouldn't, but the app, I mean, there isn't as much data for machine learning to adjust for someone that built that way. But Pierre Gaultier, I mean, he's close. <laughs> he can get him in the train. Where's Bennett? When's he start? I don't know. I generally don't know. I haven't seen him on a start list yet, but that might change in the future. My worker challenge then, like you said, each team selects roughly 12 riders and adapts their start list for each race, depending on who feels like riding what. Trofeo Calvia was the first one on the men's side. Simon Carr, Simon Carr, I don't know anymore. He outsprinted you, no, it's, Vlasov. It's Simon Carr. Simon, Simon Carr, okay. Simon Carr outsprinted Vlasov. Um, that's kind of the story. After being on the attack with the legendary Alex Aramburu. So that had to be mentioned. So first win for Yev there. McNulty as McNulty's well. McNulty's always cooking in these races. He is, but I feel like he's now waiting to attack until later in the race from people compared to when he went early and tried to drop everybody early in the past. But hey, he, he lost, so unfortunate for McNulty. Hopefully he can win some more in the end, in the, in the future. Trofeo says Salinas. Next one, this was a bit of a versatile sprint at the end. Then we got lead out for quick step by Luke Lamperti into like a, a 90 degree left bend, but he does like a crit, crit-like dive bomb into the final corner with Paul Manier who was going to sprint for a quick step in the wheel, and Manier just holds off Dainese. So really strong performance, and I don't know, I generally didn't, didn't know if, if Manier or Lamperti was going to sprint, but I had seen something on Twitter about Johan Molly, which is like the uh, one of the scouts, saying that he had a really good period on the, on the training camp. So I guess we're looking at a, not necessarily a new Alaphilippe, but a versatile sprinty Alaphilippe. Oh, can I just say, Paul Magnier, like, you look at this guy, you look at his results. Yeah. Or maybe, maybe not. Or like, you, and you look at him sprinting and his technique. You're like, how the <laughs> fuck is he yeah. going this fast? Exactly. He looks like a, a, a climber. He looks like Mary Van Seven on sprinting. It's like Tiny Milan. But he's dropping 1,400, 1,500 watts. <laughs> <laughs> he's going out of the wheel. He's so unair. I'm like, what the fuck? He, it's unbelievable. Apparently he yeah. beat Merlier in some in some town sprints where yeah. they were fully going for it. So yeah, I don't think Alaphilippe ever sprinted that quick on the flat. Um, One time maybe when I'm he won his R. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> true. But man, that's Paul Man, yeah. I mean, perfect from quick step. Uh yep. he's very, very exciting. He's a good rider. And Lamperti, he also he was supposed to go for it tonight. I haven't had a chance to watch that because it happened while well, I was asleep four hours ago, five hours ago. So Benji can fill me in. But uh, of course, yeah, that was uh, a really good race. And then there was uh, Trofeo Serra Tramontana, where uh, there was. I mean, it's kind of crazy that you've got Vlasov. I'm very surprised. Yeah, like Vlasov fully going for it in these races in January. I love it. it. It's surprising though. Like you don't see other guys who would be targeting the Giro properly or. Who are doing this race? He, uh, I looked into the power file closely. Like he, mm -hmm. he waited for the worst time to attack. So he got Aliotti, I think, to to pace really hard there. Yeah. It's a fourteen k seven percent climb, descent, little false flight kicker, and then descent to the finish. And they, Aliotti pace, 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 pace. There's a flatter section in the climb, and then last off attack, like just after the flatter <laughs> section, when everyone's heart rate went down ten bpm. Um, okay. So he should have gone earlier, but I don't think he was dropping everybody anyway because he couldn't get rid of McNulty and uh, Van Aedfeldt, who's a 22-year-old on Lotto Destiny. They relay the descent. I don't know why people were complaining. These guys walked it. They walked the descent. They like they did. They would do a quicker in training. Um, and then it was a sort of. It wasn't actually a downhill finish. Like there was a mm -hmm. corner downhill, but then it was a kicker uphill. And um, yeah, basically McNulty was on the front. Got everyone up to speed on the downhill, uh, and then was kind of fried by the time it kicked up again. And, and Van Aide felt uh, beat Vlasov in the sprint because he was positioned better in second wheel. So Van Aide felt, I think he's got a bit of, he seems decent with his race sense. I think so as well. He he knows when to bridge to people. He knows when to risk it when necessary to risk it. He he's got a, a quick sprint at the end of these type of races as well. Maybe a bit of a, a weakness in descending is what I saw on the race that came afterwards, which we'll now talk about, Trofeo Poencha, because Igor Arieta had built up a lead there. He's one of those youngsters that is on UAE now. One of those guys that came from Ken Farma that we two years ago might have said, oh, maybe that guy could end up heading to World Tour. 
Here he is. He, uh, he's also family from that Movistar coach that got binned, I think. Anyway, that's the whole side story. Von Eightfeld bridged, basically, on the, uh, on the last climb, I'm pretty sure, towards Arietta. And dominantly to the point that nobody's in the wheel of Von Eightfeld here. But he, he's not the best descender, and you see that because when he drops Arietta and goes into this descent, Arietta's suddenly back after, after dropping 15 seconds. So and, Arietta's and a good the way, descender. Note yeah. that down. On the race I said before, Arietta dropped Romeo when they were dropped by group two and came back to group two on the descent. So he, I think he's a good descender, that guy. Yep. I think he's a good descender indeed. I think they were calling him a demon descender on the broadcast, but that title is only... On the side for one man only, Alex Sanamburu, who broke his collarbone in this race. So that's descending. a very sad moment. Did he do a descending? <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. Yeah. You shouldn't, actually. It's Alex I'm not, I'm not. legendary I rider. Have a good How year. dare He's you? in a contract year. <laughs> so yeah. I'm not laughing. Exactly. <laughs> I agree. But next up, those two riders are basically, well, those two riders are looking like they might get caught or might not get caught. They've still got 20 seconds, but then Arietta slids out on a, in a corner somewhere, and then you've got Van Eetveld alone on the front, and there's some flat level for the finish, and he gets caught by the group where the cooperation was relatively okay. I think McNulty was doing quite a bit of work after Arietta had crashed in front of him, and who was still in the group? Marius Meyerhofer, mostly known for winning. No, he mostly only performs won, no. on this day, Benji. He performs on his one day year, Cadell Evans Day, 28th Actually, January. <laughs> he was also seventh on Trofeo Calvia the same week. So he's actually doing really well this week. But I, I will tell you though, the day that I will most remember this man for will always be, I think, the Junior World Championships, the last man to hold Emco's wheel. No? Yeah, but he was in the break ahead. But I think he was, yeah. Yeah, but that was our detail. Do. Do. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, continue the story. We uh we basically have the group ahead in total. They're trying to force each other to to yeah, they're trying to close each other's attacks. And Soler tries to go in the last kilometer, and Meyerhofer chooses to respond to that, which kind of stomps his sprint a tiny bit. And Palayo Sanchez, Movistar new signing. We saw him at Burgos in the Vuelta last year, out sprints him at the finish line. So Dubsky for Movistar and Telefonica celebration. Yes. No, like, did they did that. It's so good. Um, <laughs> the Spanish guys always, like, it, it's crazy, right? These guys, <laughs> a lot of them don't win very much. And they probably, like, they might not have won for, like, three years. And they'll yeah. win. And they'll have, like, their celebration dialed up. <laughs> it's like they win every week. They got it ready. Bang. He's across the line <laughs> doing the celebration. Like, <laughs> he wins every, like, he's Mati Van der Poel. I love it. Uh, so that was good. Sanchez is, um, was he the guy who dropped Remco on uh, stage 20 yes. of the Welter last year? Yeah, he's actually good. He's a yep. good rider. Um, that was really nice. Romeo was really good. He, he's, uh, Ivan Romeo, I think, is Wait. the uh, Carlos Verona replacement. I think Sanchez was second at this race last year uh, as well. Uh, yeah. Take remember something so. like that. But anyway, continue. Sorry. Oh, Ivan Romeo, he's like a 20-year-old. He's like, if he was Belgian, he would be a classic specialist, but unfortunately he's Spanish, so he will actually just be a climber, except he's six foot three. <laughs> so Carlos Verona or uh, yeah, et cetera. So um, he he climbed very, very fast uh, on the yep. Van Eidfeld, uh win day. So he looks like Verona's replacement probably on, on 50, 60 grand. Or oh, maybe more, but yeah. Uh, I think he's pretty good. Uh, so that was the Mallorcan race as well. Is he good on PCM? No, he plays PCM. That's oh, the only okay. thing I know. Well, <laughs> Sorry, good random fact. Uh, Herben Tayson beat Alexander Kristoff, who Unix tried for all week and was not competitive uh, in, which is not a good sign, I guess, because, like, frankly, if you make the finish in these races, they're not the hardest races. And at this time of the year, like, a lot of the riders hit their peak sprint numbers at this time of the year. Yeah. Uh, when they're not as fatigued it's by also... racing. So he, like, if he was going to be sprinting quick, it would be uh, it would be here. But Tyson's pretty fast. I agree. Tyson's pretty fast, was going to win more after last year, but I also feel like when it comes to Kristoff, the sprint was not necessarily perfectly let out by Unix. As in, Todd Goodmanstadt, really good lead out, 
but Christoph is not the rider that you allow to come out of your wheel or get to come out of your wheel with 100 meters to go, right? He's the guy that needs to come out with 200 meters to go, get to acceleration, and yeah. then beat everybody, yeah? And it was just too late. He, like, Herman Thijssen had launched from past them already when Christoph started launching, and then you're fucked, eh? Yeah, then you're, he's not going to win. Uh, for those of the Mjorken races, I would say takeaways are Van Aetveld. I'm keen to see how he goes this year. Yep. Uh, Pillow Sanchez and some of the young guys on Movistar. And Magnier looks like someone you don't want to be in a reduced group in with in the finish. I think he is like very, very, very fast. Uh, so that's They're my just... takeaways from it. So many youngsters, like even Nerurkar was top 10 in certain stage already for True, EF. EF, so. had, EF were pretty solid. We, we, did, yep. we didn't sort of big them up, but they were pretty solid. Uh, I think a lot of teams here have been like, we got to get some points. Tudor, yep. EF, UAE. <laughs> Tudor. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, Tudor got some points. I don't think it'll be enough to really make any difference in this cycle, though. Uh, in the women's New Yorker races, in Trofeo Felanich. Uh, Close enough. I'm supposed to be able to speak Catalan, um, but the, that was difficult. Uh, Naomi Rug Rueg won. She's on EF, and she was actually wearing, I don't know, Luke might bring this up, one of the TT oh, yeah. helmets. I don't know if it is a TT helmet or if it's a road helmet that's basically like a POC Tempo. It looks, this is going to, this is going, the UCI is going to have to step yeah. in here and be like, the, these helmets to get out of control. And it's not just them, because they have like this little lid over their ears. And I've, I'm pretty sure I saw Gana wearing a cusk also with a little lid over his yeah, ears. Yeah. So it's like a new trend to kind of make road helmets look more like DT helmets, make them more aero. And on one end, I love the innovation. They look fucking horrible, but they must be giving <laughs> them some advantage. Yeah, it definitely it would be would given an advantage now, whether you could wear it in, in the real heat. I'm not sure, but it certainly was working for the EF women's team. Uh, yeah. They were... Because uh, Valieres won the next day at Trofea Palma, uh, and then she they looked like they were going to go for a hat trick at Trofea Binisalem, uh, but uh, Persico blocked Rueg, uh, who was leading out Gasparini, the young Italian sprinter on UAE, and uh, obviously there was no sanctions. So great start for EF's women's team. They were yep. competitive and won two of the three races. Uh, and UAE pretty solid too, as well as being solid, I think, with uh, in Australia. So let's see how the EF women's team goes. New, not new man, well, sort of new management. Um, Ezra Trump, no? Yeah, a bit extremely puzzling to me, as in like, we had this whole like thing between Ezra Trump going to EF, which was the previous manager of Jumbo Visma women's team, and then Jos van Emden coming out that they were working at a lower level than amateur, is literally the quote he said, which there has to be a seriously low level to be on that level. And I think the good conclusion is that we can have a, about this whole debacle that EF and Visma Lisa Bike are both starting off the season really well. So they both seem to be in a good position at the moment. It's, it's early to take conclusions, but I think it's fair to say both are happy with the start of the season. I reckon winning Kellams Great Ocean Roadways with Rosita Reinhout at Visma's side. And here we see... EF doing really well in the Mallorca challenges. UAE, though, I want to say, yes, they were prominent and they won one of them, but they could have won two, ac three, actually. As in, in the first one, Filanic, they had four riders in the first 10 riders, but their lead out just didn't connect. Their right. lead out had lost the first two riders and their sprint had lost the lead out. So it's like they were everywhere in the group except where they needed to be. In Trofeo Palma, Valier was gone with Persico. Persico was the one that launched the attack on the descent and crashed in front of her. And Voliere was alone as a consequence. So if it wasn't for that crash, you might have seen a different outcome. But hey, it's part of cycling, staying on the bike. Otherwise, you can't win. And this is an example of that. So I think while they won with Gasparini, they probably have a feeling of like, ah, there was something more in this. But that's it for me as well. When it comes to the Morocco Challenge, I'm curious to see what the next couple of women's races will have. And I think there is a Valencia Classic coming somewhere in the next week as well. So curious what happens there in a the sprint. Uh, the last race recap is GP Marseillaise, which was uh, last night. So I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. But Ooh. I saw the little quick highlight, Geniette's uh, beat Baudin at the finish. Geniette's is uh, a quite a versatile rider, just difficult for him to often win because he is about six foot three without the biggest sprint normally. Or, uh, But I, I really, really like him as a rider yeah. of Luxembourger. Uh, Zangler crash, which I don't like. 
Uh, so I'll have to check on his condition. Um, but yeah, you I, said it. I need a... Shinyata's sprint is not amazing, so nah, not the best. I generally didn't expect him to beat Boudin. Maybe because Boudin, pro cycling manager back in the day, was a good sprinter, but <laughs> in real life, he, oh, he oh, missed this is the a travel doll guy. Yep, he's a travel doll guy on Arjun's app. Nairo got to be like, what the fuck did I do wrong to sit out a season? <laughs> I mean, true? I'm joking, but also I'm not. Yep. Aren't they MPCC? They are MPCC, and they put him back in the team. I mean, I'm not saying that's even wrong. Like, the, I'm not saying that's wrong, right? Double like, standard. That's the, like, that's the rule. The rules are, it's not at, before. It is now. If you get Tramadol now is doping, right? Luke will correct me if I'm wrong, but... Well, that's um, not Colombia. Tramadol is now an ADRV, anti-doping rule violation, but it wasn't. And so Bodan got his results from that Giro and Ald, but no sanction. Yep. And so, like, yeah, like, you're not obliged, I would not think, to, to um, suspend him. But Nairo got blacklisted for a year so it's like anyway um, talking about Nairo you haven't seen it yet I'm pretty sure but you gotta watch the Colombian National Championships replay if you saw it somewhere no no I've, short, seen, I've seen the highlights yeah holy in short, shit it was a really good race because it was a breakaway with like former Bahrain rider Alejandro Osorio that's the guy that got kicked out of the team according to the articles because of a breaching COVID-19 rules it was, and, more, it was more than that. It was like he just, there was a lot of problems, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that was the public statement, yeah, the yeah. one I, I mentioned. But he was pretty strong in the breakaway, strongest rider in the breakaway. For, but from behind, we had an attack when the gap was four minutes, I'm pretty sure, or six minutes, somewhere in between. From the peloton, we saw an attack of uh, Igita together with Bernal. And you know how the attack happened? It's typical. Because those two riders were like doing the attack, and Quintana was in the wheel, and he looks behind him to see who will take over. And he keeps looking behind him. Nobody takes over, and the two ride off into the sunset. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. Man. Same but thing anyway, over and over again. I uh, forgot to mention the end of the race, but hey, go watch it. Oh yeah, a sorry one, sorry one. Um, yeah, but like three he didn't seconds. Get, he didn't get fired for being a bad rider. He's a good rider. Um, yeah. Okay. Or talented rider, but. Uh, yeah, it's it's difficult. It's also difficult for guys coming from a different continent and then yep. they're young, 22 years old, and yeah, maybe the teams can also do a better job integrating them. Uh, for I sure. Would say. Uh, but Volkla I still, third in Marseilles as well. I want to see how he goes. I still remember stories from like Gaviria and Contreras back in Quickstep that they were like staying with a Belgian family or something and Contreras couldn't really adapt to that as well as Gaviria and that's why he yeah. ended up leaving the team and that shows that there's teams that are trying to do everything they can, but also it might not be enough for every single one of those riders that might need more support because they're here without their family, usually, without any support outside of the team. And if you're fully dependent on your team, then you also don't have a third party really overlooking that. So that's kind of a, a yeah. niffy situation sometimes. How, how are you adapting to the UK, Benji? <laughs> it's fucking cold, man. <laughs> I don't go outside. <laughs> Can't be colder than Belgium. Yeah, I've, um, I don't know. How am I adapting to the UK? I enjoy living here in one place now because it's in one place. So less yeah. traveling, that's fun. When it comes to training, I'm looking at, uh, at riding uh, indoor more at the moment, but I'm going to jump outdoor, I think, next week. I'm going to try and visit Box Hill for the first time. So let's hope oh, I can yeah. find it. Yeah. On Zwift, it's like in the London map. And then I, then I open the map and Google no, where Box sorry. Hill is. <laughs> and it's Sounds nowhere sad. near. Near Dorking or something? I think so. Near Rygate. I don't I fucking know a, what that I is. I had a dentist in Rygate, orthodontist. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he did a very good job. Um, <laughs> I can't tell. <laughs> anyway, speaking of, of uh, I guess, British people, <laughs> what a segue. <laughs> Geraint Thomas. I knew he was doing the Giro. Like, yeah. I, I know he... I think he wanted to do the tour. Like, I don't think he wanted to do the Giro necessarily if the parkours were neutral. But yeah. then when you see the TTKs and how flat they are in the Giro and the, compared to the tour, and then you see, yeah, like, I, I then thought he's going to, he has to do the Giro, especially with how soft the Giro start list is outside of one, uh, one notable exception to that. 
But then I did not expect him to do the tour double, Benji, because frankly, he's been terrible in his second Grand Tours, right? Yep. Like the Vuelta last year was a complete write-off. I'm not sure when else it, I have to check when else it happened, but I have a, and the problem is like, in 2021, when he came into the, when he did the tour, he wasn't helpful really um, as a domestique. Like Correct. I'm not really. So when did he do? Oh, he hasn't. This he hasn't done. So 2017, he did Giro Tour double DNF both, and he crashed out of both. Uh, 2015, he did Tour of Welter double, which is more common. Um, and so, yeah, it's a new thing. Uh, he's never done the Giro, never completed the Giro Tour double because he DNF. So yeah. what do you make of this? I don't know. On one end, I feel like I see the Giro as the, as the race he should go to, to be able to contend for a podium. For sure. So that's, that's number one. So it's a good idea to go to the Giro. And I feel like he expressed, if I recall correctly, that he felt like he missed out last year by not going to the Tour de France. And maybe it's more uh, the emotional reason that he wanted to go to the Tour de France because he missed out on the, on the whole festival of it. That, that is the reason that he chose to do it. Because we've seen that Ineos is now... like The fact that Bernal went to the Vuelta, that shows that the hierarchy in the team chose it and not necessarily the best possible rider at that moment. And maybe for Thomas that's something similar. Does that mean Thomas will be shit at the Tour de France? Not necessarily. It might be that this might be the year where he can switch it, but I'm more confident in the Giro than for the Tour, and in the Tour I'd expect him to fold into a, a more domestique role in my head at the moment. That's how I view it at the moment, and I think he's still valuable in that role. I think he can offer something there, but then he needs to be... There were stages in the Vuelta where he was competitive, but he would need to be at least that level to be able to do something for others in the team as well. Well, the one stage where he was fighting for the stage win, with that, he can domestique somewhat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he could have domestiqued for Ghana to win that one. Yeah. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but it's also... Think, go ahead. I actually think if he focused on the tour, he also could do really well there. Got the gravel okay. stage. You've got these really attritional stages in the third week uh, where it's just like an energy contest. I actually think he would have... I don't know how Rodriguez and Pitcock will progress, but I would be more confident saying G would get a really good result in the tour than those two. Um, Top five? I would even say he could shoot for a podium Okay. at the tour. Like that Isla stage, I think really suits him. But, but the start list is so much stronger. So then when you have the Giro where, okay, he's, right, he's in second right now, penciled in. I, I, I don't I you couldn't put Simon Yates above him based on recent Grand Tour performance. So or Correct. whoever's doing it for Jaco. So I think it's just the reality of the start list. That being said, listen, if he wants to go to the tour, that's fine. But I think it needs to be very clear that the got like who is the leaders, Pidcock yep. or Rodriguez. That needs to be based on the reality of, of shape as well. And I'll uh, yeah, it needs to be not Steve Cummings saying, gee, what do you think we should do tomorrow um, in the tour? That'd be my concern. Uh, so, but I think, yeah, it's still, you don't want to send too young a team, you know, because if Roe can't go because he doesn't have the level, yep. you, although you've got Kwiatkowski and Castro, they kind of, they sort of, they won a few grand tours in their life. Uh, but good. it's interesting. Um, yep. It's also I like, wonder, where's Aaronsman going then? The, he's on the longest of the Giro that I can find, but yeah, I have no full Giro, confirmation right? of that. Together with Viviani that said he will try to ride himself into the team of the Giro, which I'm not sure I would do that. I would just sprint with Ghana. You've got just as much chance yeah. to win a stage. Yeah, yeah. Just send, And uh, outside of that, Foss. He's on the long list, but if you sign him for... For this team, you have to send them to the Giro. Like, if you believe in him, you have to send him to the Giro. I might yeah, not yeah. believe that he's going to be the all-out GC rider, but as a domestique, he's Giro worthy. God, I have a, they wish a TT. If they have Aaronsman, Foss, G, Ganna, <laughs> Hater? That's, that's the strongest TT team I've ever seen. 
Exactly. There's actually is they have a lot of riders, you know, to send and then you got the frailers to Plu. I think to Plus is doing the tour. Where's Bernal do Bernal Wait. is he doing the, the tour? Would Ineos uh, win the TTT World Championships if it existed in 2023? Yes, right? Or yeah, would Visma Ineos show up? I think Ineos would not, win. Not Ineos anymore. lost Roglic and Dennis. Yeah. And uh, Visma lost well. Yeah, Visma lost. I think I think Ineos would win the a TTT. Yeah. yeah. Imagine um, if they didn't. Thomas Hater, Tarling, Ghana. It's a Aaronsman team is ridiculous. Boss. Uh, okay, that's sort of the Ineos uh, long list news. There was also a, tied to this a, re a sort of press conference by John Allen, which I think you attended, Benji, yep. who's the new CEO of Ineos, uh, where he said that Brailsford's actually not sort of fully disappeared. He's kind of still there as head of Ineos Sport. I think the reality of that is that if you're doing a rebuild at Manchester United, the uh, time you have to maybe watch footage of Leonard van Edfeld, yeah, but... uh attacking in Trofea, fucking Tramontana, Valenciana, Mickey Mouse is limited. How I perceived that press conference, the way the answers were given and so forth, felt to me like, one, I get really good vibes that he's a nice guy, which is irrelevant for the job. Two, <laughs> I have the... The feeling that he's very good with politically saying the correct answer to the question. As in, he's well media trained. To the point that when oh, he's giving an answer like that... Just fucked off. They, like for example, when a question occurs and someone asks, oh, was there ever a, a question on the table about Ineos's certainty that they will keep supporting the, uh, the cycling team? And he was like, oh, that question was never on the table. Which might be true, but it's also like... There has to be someone in the team that brought it up at some point, realistically, based on the on the last year. So it's like take everything with a grain of salt as well. Yeah, he come he comes from the McLaren structure, the F1 structure, so probably they're a little bit more polished. Um, but yeah, it was interesting to hear that the the budget hasn't gone down. So that seems like the budget hasn't gone down, but a lot of expensive riders have left. So maybe they're yeah. building a war chest for Remco. Or they've spent it all on extension. <laughs> they paid it all to Movistar <laughs> for Rodriguez. <laughs> uh, Eusebio, he's, he's got <laughs> he's having a big. Had a, he had a big Christmas. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that was interesting to hear. Uh, so maybe they they're going to be very active in the transfer markets in the next couple of years. Yeah. Uh, that was the news from G. We'll get on to a couple of race previews, just a uh, rapid fire. I'll do Alula. It is a pretty, uh, pretty similar stage as all these, really. There's like basically uphill sprints. There is one where it's like 4Ks, 4%, but it's not as difficult, I don't think, as the one that Varenskold beat Milan in uh, yep. last year, that sort of finish. All of the sprints basically finish in these uphill drags, which are quite grippy, I think. Consoni won one last year. You've got to get your timing really right. And then there's the stage five, which is the sort of the main GC stage, which is actually a very unique parkour. You don't yes. really see too many like this, which is basically flat. And there has been crosswinds before on this stage from Alula Old Town. And then they do a 3K 12% climb, proper steep stuff. And then there's a flat. 8Ks at the end, which can also wind direction is important, finishing at 1100 meters, the sky views of uh, Harat uh, Uwariyid. Um, this was, the start list for this has improved in terms of GC riders quite a bit from the days of Luca Mezgetz battling out for second on that stage to Buitrago against Formolo against Guerrero who won GC overall last year so now Simon Yates doing it, Benji, no doubt because of the title sponsorship of the race yep. organizer of Jayco. Yeah, for certain. And I believe like Melir, Milano, Grunewagen, those riders on the start list, I expect Grunewagen to win one sprint, Milano to win one sprint. I feel like for the parkour, there's, a, there's not much confirmation yet. As in like, I still feel like we're 
we're missing a few sprinters is how I feel when I look at the start list. I was expecting there to be more. So maybe a team like Bora, who currently has three riders on their provisional start list, might include a sprinter here or there that we don't see at Kokar. Might be able to do well on these on these uphill drags, to be honest, these uphill sprints. So curious who Tudor will send. Will this will will this be an out of it decline party? I hear Luke saying from the other room. <laughs> and uh yeah, I'm I'm kind of looking forward to the to the last stage again, like you mentioned, that one with the the steep climb and then the flat portion towards the finish line where Tim DeClerc was so bloody good. I think was it last year? But it nah, reminds me before. of it's irrelevant to this, but it reminds me of that stage in 2017, Jira, I think stage 22, Asiago, uh, a stage where Dumoul ended up winning the Malia Rosa and Nibali was fighting him and I was depressed after that stage because that meant Dumoul had won the Giro instead of Nibali, but kind of reminded me because it's also a climb in a flat portion, so I like that vibe, it's very rare in cycling, but um, yeah, sorry about bringing up Nibali because I'm not so happy with him, I'll talk about it later. Anyway... There's Jason um, Tesson here, who's decent for Total. Uh, there's Dusan Rajevic. Watch out for him. Uh, just, yeah, GC. Be careful if you if you're near him. Uh, yeah. Well, Simon Yates has to win. <laughs> like, no ifs, no buts. He has to win. I... It's their title. It's their second most important race after the Tour de France, and they're sending him to. You know, no offense. It's a two dot one. Like, and you look at the other GC riders here, and it's like our boy Le Cerf. Is and is the sort of top three favorite. Rightly, he's like a young climber on the quick step, so I'm keen to see how he goes. But Simon Yates, Simon Yates, Finn Fisher Black is on the provisional for UAE. He's also dangerous. So, but yeah, Yates I'm has also, to win. I'm also intrigued which of those like versatile rulers might end up in the top 10, like we have seen oh, on this Fred parkour. Wright. Like, I was also looking at Sobrero and maybe Milesi. True, true. Sobrero, yep. Formula is probably going to be somewhere up there. I remember him last time on this parkour yeah, as well. Yeah, he was good last year. He's now at a different team. I completely forgot which team he went to. Movistar? He went to Movistar, yeah. They're building... Yeah. Shandri's building an Italian... They, they realize they got to send Italians to the Giro. <laughs> <laughs> They're not a summer team anymore. <laughs> yeah. So... But yeah, Yates, the pressure's on him. He's got, yeah. I mean, there's Ben Hermans. I'd hope to, this is the sort of race he used to win. Uh, Where the fuck is he these days? Cofidis. Wait, what? Really? Yeah, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> I did not expect that. Did we do, we did uh, a preview on this, didn't we? Completely forgot. <laughs> we did. I think Merlier will be the best sprinter, but it's actually, I, I'm keen to see this race, uh, see some of the sprints. Uh, otherwise, there's Etoile de Bessage. I would say it has probably, the, it has the strongest start list overall. Uh, yeah. it usually it usually does, frankly, uh, because Ooh. it has Trek, it had Ineos last year. Um Valenciano's although, pretty strong too, but we'll get to that. Yeah, sorry, yeah, but that's a dot pro, sorry. That's a dot pro. No. Yeah. He, I don't know. Uh, doesn't matter. Ineos are not doing Bersage this year. They sent Tullet and Tarling last year and they were they were good in the T T. Uh yep. so it is a little bit weaker. Uh but still. Mads Pedersen usually cleans up a sprint here. Uh, Arno Zulie's not turning up. It was seeing him against uh, Pedersen was great on this sort of mon bouquet or punchy finish last year. But uh, stage one, uphill uh, kick at the end, uh, a bit of guard. That's just like not got Mads Pedersen written all over it. Uh, probably Kosner for in second. Uh, then there's another one which is probably on too difficult for him. That's more Kosnifra. It's the perfect finish for him because it's 900 meters, nine percent, two minute effort. Uh, stage three is a medium mountain stage. Benji will say they're just hills uh, before a flat sprint. So we'll see if Mate, the new trek line up. It's four k at four percent. I can do it backwards. Me, medium mountain buddy. Uh, so we'll see trek chasing uh, on that stage. See if they got a better team to do that this year. Then there's a uh, a four and a half k, four point six percent medium mountain finish uh, on stage four. So again, we're seeing a lot of these. The limit for for Pedersen, he I, I think he can win all of them on his day, except maybe the one k nine percenter. But uh, and then there's the uh, final TT, which is uphill to Ailes, ten point five k's, and then the final. One actually has some steep passing at 3k, 6%. Yep. Can Pedersen win GC here? 
with Bonnie? Uh, yes, he can. I think this is, was the parkour where Stuart and Betiel were fighting for GC two years ago. Mombu cannot being part of that. Yeah. I'm looking at GC at Benjamin Toma, Mats Peterson, the TT kind of riders. What do you think of? Well, Betiel won this race before on this kind of parkour, but Alex Segard is a good TT, right? Yeah. But I'm I'm not sure about. Yeah, he should be able to survive those hills, no? Top top he ten. Sh- Top five? The hills, the hills are pretty fast and gradual, so it just depends. It's the bonies, and the, it's if you lose thirty seconds in bonies, I can't see him making that up on Pedersen in a ten k TT. You know, yeah, so for sure, that's the that's the problem for someone like that. Wells. You really have to be winning stages, uh, as you said, Betiol. He should be good in those sort of finishes, but he's hot, hit and miss. He came second in this race in GC twice. What is Do EF? They've got a strong team. Do they? Healy's TT should be pretty good, but he's going to have to win a stage solo, which, by the way, Healy, Healy's got to go for stage three. For sure. Right? Yeah. He's got to go. If they want to win GC, that's the play. You can't Wait, let Pedersen can't, win that. Can't he podium the first one too, maybe? Like, 700 meters, 800 meters, 7%. Pedersen's going to win it. Like, that's that's fixed in stone, but you know, to Get a four bonus seconds there. Yeah. Are you think the pure punchers like like Kosnifra or like yeah. Ediol or like Magnus Court? I think that's gonna be tough True. for him. Difficult to, to get those bonies. Um so uh, anyway, it's a it's a lovely little race. Uh and there's a decent number of uh world tour teams going. We need to see Volkla as well. I'm not sure if he's doing yes. Provence. But Provence doesn't have a mountain stage either, I don't think. So that's his first stage race of the year after starting in Marseille. Uh, last preview, the best one. This is like a Grand Tour level start list every year. Uh, Valenciana, we've got Vlasov, Kemner, Hindley, Bora sending a stack team, Sivakov, Vine. We've got Milan sprinting with Morich and Buitrago. Matthews has already won this year, Bilbao. Really, really nice race. This is the race last year that really coshed a one, and the final stage is really good. Every stage looks about the same, frankly. <laughs> it's got like a medium mountain climb of varying gradients for the, about 15 k's from the finish after a lumpy stage. That's stage one. Stage two, about the same, maybe a bit of a shorter climb. Stage three is more of a pure sprint stage, but you got to manage the breakaway well because there's a steep climb in the about halfway through where a smart break could really get ahead and be difficult yeah. to be brought back. The two, the main GC stage yes. is stage four, which is a funny old stage, uh, sort of quite hilly all day. I think it'd be over three thousand meters climb, one hundred seventy five k's. They finish up Valdebo, which all of these riders have done a million times in their December and January training camps in Valencia. For sure. Uh, but they have a rampas climb, the Pego climb, Alto Mate. de Misery. <laughs> yes, Alto de, del Miserat. Fun fact, two weeks ago on the market of Pego, I went to a Turkish kebab store and it's fucking good. So if you're ever there, that is a spot well, to go to. What's your go-to? Um, I, just ate, I just ate frites with nuggets, but Oh, my, so you wife get a kebab. Ate, my wife ate def- a kebab with falafel and it was apparently listeners. the best thing in the world. No, no, no. The, the falafel kebab was apparently really fucking good. And I generally, I, I trust my wife in that, in that judging of the foods. So I He's advise people. And it's also expert. like they had mayo on the table, a full thing. So me as a Belgian with a bottle of mayo, I'm always happy. Okay. Well, they won't be getting kebabs here because they're starting a 20 minute climb at about 9%. <laughs> Uh, and then it's 16 k's of rolling to the finish. This looks really, really good for Bora. I'll say, like for Kamna and Vlasov, with that sort of climb, 20 minutes, and then that sort of rolly finish. Very, very, very good for them to play numbers. So, um, also steep ramps like on Bilbao. top. Yeah. Who do you Once like to get win over... this? UAE got a strong team too. Who do you like to? Who do I like to win this? Me personally. I like Vlasov to win it. Uh, I think so as well, actually. I think he's a good name to, to throw out there. Allah wins the stage, by the way. Orlis Alois. Yeah. 
him versus Matthews, and he's going to beat Matthews on a flat finish. And the sprint field is uh, a little bit soft. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's... And there's, like, actually two sprint stages. Yeah, yeah, there's, like, a couple of sprints. Like, Milan against Matthews against... Milan wins the flat ones. Uh, Turnison. Yeah, he should. He should. But he's got if he does, he should get fired. A foot shorter than him, leading him out. <laughs> God, sorry. So we'll see how that works. Um, <laughs> okay, that's all the race previews. It's a lot of racing coming up. Uh, I think HBO or Max just announced, not a plug, obviously. HBO or Max just announced that um, in the US at least, you can watch a decent proportion of the races that yep. Eurosport and Discovery or GCN Plus used to have by doing, I think, the Bleacher Report or like the BR add-on to your subscription. You Anyway, there is a way to watch it in the US now, all these Mickey Mouse races that we love dearly and hold close to our heart. Um, and then you also Next have up like Australia? Like Peacock and NBC. Australia, <laughs> you're fucked. No solution yet, I don't think. So it's that's, so sad. Yeah. That stuff. Uh, the TDF and Giro announced wild cards for, uh, unsurprisingly, Israel Chud, Tudor. Oh, Israel already got their wild card, I think, and they just accepted it. Uh, but the Tudor, Bardiani, and Palti were the discretionary wildcards of the Giro, unsurprisingly. So an Italian team, Corotech, loses out because Tudor uh, yeah, are but a sponsor of the race. Also because they're not good enough. Tudor's a better team. So sorry, yeah, yeah, but Tudor's a better I, team as well. I don't want to hear it. Q36.5, also a better team. So if you want to be an Italian team and actually pretend True. that you deserve to be at the race, then at least be good enough to be at the race. Yes, that also counts for Palti Cometa. Yes, they want to stage with... Davide buys, but that was a fluke stage, so it's not replicable. But yeah, they won with Fortunato, but he, they don't have Fortunato now. They have Piganzoli, which is a good rider, which is probably better than Fortunato in certain yeah. races. So, but mo it's also a team that is not World Tour Grand Tour Giro worthy, in my opinion. So it's okay. It's politics, but it's also positive because. We can always complain about, oh, they're selecting the Italian teams, but let's be honest about it. If they didn't, these Italian teams wouldn't exist. So I think that's a positive side. Lotto decided not to go. Uh, and I, I checked their points because I was curious about what they did last year after, after like skipping the Giro. Was it worth it or not? And apparently they scored 1,400 UCI points last year during the Giro by doing those Mickey Mouse, Chat, GPT, French and Belgian races. So I guess if they do a similar route again this year when it comes to the schedule, and also get similar results, which the lead didn't win all of them. Like he he won, I think he won, I think two of them, and then they got close with plenty of riders that you wouldn't necessarily think of immediately. And if they can do that again, I guess it's worth skipping. I guess. Yep. Uh, for the tour, Lotto and Israel were going by automatically, and Total and Unix uh, got the two wild cards. There's no other French Pro Conti team uh, missing out, so not as hotly contested with so many of the French teams in uh, in World Tour at the moment automatically getting uh, getting invitations. And so, yeah, hard to argue against Total and Unix going uh, there. I would say look out for Bardiani and the Giro. I think they're, you know, Pellizzari and other riders are quite nice. Um, they're actually not bad. So I'd, I'd like to see them in, in breakaways. In Italy, there was also... You're going to have to run me through this, Benji. Your... Your erstwhile hero, Vincenzo Nibali, acting a fool. Yeah. Actually, like, first of all, step one, he's got this thing on Twitch called Squalo TV. He's got a Twitch channel where he live streams, uh, a cycling topic discussion thing that he does with Pozzo Vivo and some other people. He's on there. And one of their takes was that it was the whole story we've heard millions of times of, oh, the Zwift Academy people in races. Uh, is it a good pathway to get into cycling for like for Jay Vine back in the day, for example, like this Italian guy called Mattia Gafuri? Is this a valid way to get into the sport? Because technique might not be there and they might be a danger to themselves and to other people. And it's only based on what per kilo that they perform on Zwift and so forth. And anyway, that's just, that's like the, the thing that started it behind the scenes. But then it all like transpired when Mattia Gafuri, the Italian we spoke about, a rider that is in this year's Zwift Academy, he is a finalist, I'm pretty sure, in that as well. And I think towards the end of December, I think 30th of December, he posted a Strava activity where, where he beat one of Nibali's KOMs. He took one of Nibali's KOMs and Nibali responded to that 
Bravo Gaffa. This is a, a Benji translation, so it's about 90% accurate. But the most important part, parts will be accurate. I'm not putting Nibli out of in a bad light. He puts himself in a bad light here. And he said, okay, bra bravo, Gaffa. After this, you need to win three or four more Grand Tours and some classics, and you need to lose three kilos, and then maybe you can start celebrating. So, sorry, but uh, Nibli's a fucking dick sometimes towards competitors in Grand Tours. We saw it towards Roglic, I think, when he said, oh, come take a look at my trophies. Uh, back in back in the day when they were having their squirrel in the Giro 2018, but then then later on, like it was always competitor based. It's never been like as pitiful as an Italian youngster taking a Strava KM, then roasting him that he hasn't won Grand Tour. Sorry, but that purely his ego. That's purely Nibali's ego that's been hurt, and he's putting that out there, and he's being a little bitch right now. Oh, he's 39 years old. It goes to show, like, and it's <laughs> and not just Nibali, but, like, it doesn't matter how many Grand Tours you win, how many races you win, how many people will say you're the best. Like, if you're an insecure person, yeah, you're an, you're an insecure person. You're, like, and you're Vincenzo fucking Nibali, man. Grow up. I know. But I'm surprised he's not more supportive of Vergalito and Go Is it because they basically did it their own way and forced their own way into the world of cycling. Because Frank, it let's is. be real, like Italian cycling is not in a place where they can say Vergolito is not good enough to be going at least pro Conti. Like they yep. have two riders in the top 50. Yep. Um, and there's like old school guys like Berio, he's not ranked in the top 200 riders in the world. There's like 30 other Italians ahead of him. So like, Maybe these new breed of data focused guys are the way forward. Um, so now I'm surprised there's so much pushback against it because I thought they'd yeah. be supportive of other Italians trying to break in. I know that Brambilla came on the Squalo TV to discuss it as well. The Zwift uh, generational gap between traditional versus new way to get into the sport. And Brambilla was actually supportive of Vergalito and, and Gafuri, who actually both have a podcast. Together, so they're the Italian LR and Benji. Nothing apparently. good that comes out of people having a podcast, Benji. <laughs> but um, and Betiol and Nibali were kind of against the the new way to get into the sport. But what do you mean but against? What do you mean against? I don't fucking know, man. Like, are, uh, are they like? What do you mean? <laughs> like, they're doing something illegal, or that like... they're no, that they're missing out on important skills to get into the sport and to be able to ride in the peloton, but. That, we've gone over that. Didn't of times. do a? Didn't he do a million outdoor races as well? Vine did like, as well. Yes, people act like the Vine literally was like not allowed to leave his house. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, they act like he was. You don't think he and was mate, also training and racing outside? Bradbury just pod podium Santa Suda under last week as well. The women's race, so they're actually performing. Eh, they're not dog shit. Jason Osborne, Jay Vine, Virgilito, Bradbury, Matt uh, Alderman was also good. I think she's top yep. 10 GC or near about. Like, it's a finished conversation. If you got the watch exactly. and you get through by Zwift Academy, you're probably a pretty good but, rider, especially as it's more competitive now. So many riders know it's you get on a pro team, you get a pro contract. There's no, like, if you win the competition, you get the pro contract. It's not like when you go to a training camp, beat everybody, but someone like Nibali says, Oh yeah, but you know you don't. I don't like the you know the way you look, and so you don't get a contract. No, you get the contract if you win the prize. So it's yeah. like competitive now, and so it's a higher quality of people even. And it's also completely unrelated to what Nibali said in that Strava comment. I will not believe that that comment by Nibali is related to the his disagreement on the generational gap between traditional and new ways to get into sport. It's his ego getting hurt. That's the only thing I want to hear. But, but I do have to add about KOM. I don't care. I don't know. I don't. It, it's more important than Grand Tours, I guess. But I do have to add important closure towards it. They both went on Squalo TV afterwards to, to kind of close the whole situation. I haven't heard that, uh, that conversation yet, but the only right thing for Nibali to do is to, to apologize for saying that. In oh, my opinion. So this could, oh, so this might just be marketing. Imagine. This, this is oh my god is this, are, are they taking this is logan paul ksi are they oh my god they've they've done it a they just fight. got us to talk about his podcast by fabricating this beef. both podcasts we, we spoke about squalor tv and 
the other Wait, podcast. Nick, yeah. I think they've done us here, Benji. <laughs> they've gotten yeah. a free plug by, by Fabric. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, or Nibley's the 12 year old. Who knows? Um, <laughs> but I need I was, to ask the audience I was amused. should I forgive Vincenzo Nibley or should I not? Or is it depends on behavior. what he said in this in the podcast. It's Italian. I will never know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, flags fly forever. He won those. You know, remember how he made you feel in your heart when he won, Benji. Um, he lost the quite last a lot of races sort of... too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> true. There's a lizard that's just gone up to the door. He's looking at me. Look at him go. Where are you going, buddy? You can't come in here. Big lizard. Um, last topic before we get on to sort of what what else we're doing. Uh, this was very, very strange, but unsurprising, sadly, was E3 Saxo Classic, who is kind of an independent race. You, you don't, everyone maybe, people maybe think that all the, the Cobble Classics are owned by the same organizer. That's not correct. Uh, they're sort of an ind independent race, and they have a history of pro uh, promoting the race with, uh, they would think provocative, most people would say distasteful or sexist yeah. uh, posters, and... Uh, they released a cartoon on their Twitter account uh, last week uh, related to Wout van Aert. Uh, Wout van Aert won the cyclocross race when he kicked his saddle off his bike, and they the cartoon had a photo of uh, like a, a crowd that was supposed to be representing LGBT people, and it, Benji will correct me if my Dutch is, is wrong, uh, saying the crowd was saying, oh, they're enjoying this, uh, with the implication that they were enjoying it, because Wout van Aert's saddle had come off and... Um, Combination. You know, yeah. So how the correct translation is basically that the cartoon was saying, the, the title above the cartoon was LGBTQ, uh, people are enthusiastic about Wout van Aert uh, finishing without a saddle. Oh, obviously a hom homophobic comment. And then the, the audience, spectators in the background with a, a rainbow flag above them, um, in in like the text balloon, it said about Van der Poel, his rainbow jersey, of course, saying that they're shouting about his rainbow jersey, which is also just a. It's not. Yeah, right. Like that one's less homophobic, but it's kind of like a cheap dig, and I don't like it. And and also, additionally, it's not fucking funny, man. Like it's fucking nineties, eighties, all over again, and it's typical E3 marketing. Because twenty eleven, they posted a basically a. A P magazine model, which P magazine is kind of like the what's that that magazine that was Playboy, Playboy with all the yeah. naked women and so forth. Basically, that was that as like the the poster of their race. Which okay, that's that woman chose to be on that and so forth. So that's less yeah, it's it's pretty degrading still anyway. But then the next one was who is the fastest in Heidelberg in in 2014 with uh. Uh, a female cyclist riding three other females like a horse. Well, that's the thing. It's not just using like attractive women to promote the race. It's like, yeah. Also, they're shown in like a degrading way. Like, that's why these posters were like so distasteful yeah. and just straight up misogynistic. Like, it's not just, it's also, yeah, like, it, it takes that one step further. And then there was like the, pl the one playing on the Peter Sagan. Um, yeah. When he, I think, what pinched a podium girl on the bottom or someone on the stage on the bottom, yeah. it like basically was replicating that. So that this that's the history of the organization. They were back in 2011, 2014, 2015. I haven't remembered the ones recently, but they've got four. It was an old lady. In the last right. in the last two years, it was basically who's going to be able to to kiss Eugene or something like an old woman's name, um, a grandma, and then the grandma was like preparing her lips to kiss the the winner or something on the finish line. What was that? Man, that's all right. That was, yeah, that's just West Flemish humor. Yeah, that's all right. Um, Still bad humor, but... but then they took it down and apologized for it. But what yeah. is sort of curious to me here is, right, and we've, we've got a recent comparison. So this is a world tour race organizer. This ain't a, a small race. This is a big yeah. race, world tour category race. And when Mattis Mickles and Herben Tyson uh, put out their... Kevin Tyson posted a photo of Mickles last year in Tour of Guangxi. Uh, they, the UCI media on Twitter, they had a tweet out and a statement out the next day, basically saying that they condemn all forms of uh, discriminatory behavior, racist behavior, 
and they referred it to the UCI Disciplinary Commission the next day. Yep. And I would say this is in worse faith, even, this poster is in worse faith. because it's, it's a UCI race. It's a UCI World Tour race. And they haven't said, they, I've not seen anything. Why are the people who, whatever, tweeted this or whatever, not referred to the Disciplinary Commission in the same way? Yep. As Mickles was. Um, now maybe, maybe David Lepartian, because he's in the United, you know, in the United Arab, Arab Emirates, he wants to get back to Europe first before he tweets about diversity and inclusion. Um, doesn't want to condemn it there, but, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I was very surprised not to see them make a statement about it. So, because yep. it's, it's straight up a homophobic thing. Um, yeah. And it's like. How can you not, like, how can you, if you're a, a gay rider in the peloton <laughs> and you're seeing a world tour race tweet that out and UCI just says nothing, oh, all right, and fair enough. It's also like cycling is not a sport where it seems openly accepted to come out as, as gay in the peloton as well, I feel like, because percentage-wise... Percentage-wise, in, in the men's peloton, there have to be some, on paper, people that might not be straight, which is perfectly fine, but the fact that it's not... It's per also probably fine if they don't want it public, but it has a reason that they're not necessarily being public about it in my head then as well, and that shouts to me that it doesn't feel like a safe environment for them to come out with that. And stuff like this makes it harder for for people that are in that situation to be open about that. Yeah. Anyway, maybe something is going on behind the scenes. The UCI is saying, what the fuck was that? You need to take that down. I don't know. Um, but yeah, just I interesting to compare did. the two. Interesting to compare the two, the two incidents uh, because yep. to me, they both fall roughly under the same bracket of behavior. Um, True. That, that was uh, our news roundup. What have you got on the next week, Benji? Because I got a lot on. But what, are you, what have you got on? Quite a bit, actually. I'm, I'm going to go on my box hill ride, as I mentioned earlier. Going to make a little video of that, yep. hopefully. I'm not good at vlogging videos. That's just, I need to, you, you like, I saw some of your vlogs that might or might not be, be somewhere on the internet. Vlog, yeah. And you've got that going. Whenever I put a camera on myself, I kind of don't know what to say anymore when it's not on a podcast for some reason. So I need to, like, train myself on doing that, also doing that in public, but I'm trying to do that for a, new, a few new videos. Um, I'm also considering hiring an editor, so that's also, I've already got someone that is very interested, so that could make my videos a bit better, so I'm, I'm focusing on that stuff, but also, I'm gonna try and enjoy these races, Valenciana, Alula, and so forth, those kind of races, and what else is in my car uh, calendar in the next week? Uh, I don't know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and ride up more on well, Swift, of... I guess. Okay, that's fair enough, you got a lot of races to watch. What a, here's my, you, you ready for what I'm doing? I'll fly, <laughs> flying out on Tuesday night, fly Barcelona, fly straight to Amsterdam, train to Bisma HQ, then got meetings, then something will be so cool. And then I've got to fly back to Barcelona, to Andorra. Then Mrs. Rouge will meet me. Um, <laughs> it's going to be an odyssey. Wait. <laughs> it's going to be an odyssey. And then I'm going to, yeah, go on. Two questions. How is Toby doing? Toby's good, enjoying this. Well, it's, it's actually scarily warm in Andorra at the moment. Okay. Question two. How are your horses? Uh, Rogue Bear is flying, man. It placed in Sydney like and Queensland City Saturday races multiple times. So yeah, Rogue Bear's doing really, really well. Is there a place where people can follow Rogue Bear or is that does he not have an Instagram <laughs> you page follow yet? It? Like, you mean like has it got his own Strava account? <laughs> his Instagram oh, great, account. great track. Great track work this morning, Rogue Bear. And yeah, give him a kudos. Fuck, he's uh, look at his heart rate. That's actually that. Uh, I'm all full. Of, I'm in my Should we something create a with Strava? Like a strap? Should we create a Strava for racehorses so people can follow their racehorse and see the track work it did? There? Imagine you're an owner. You see, fuck, my horse hasn't done any exercise for four days. What, what are they doing with it? It's What's got a race on What's the heel like on this horse? What's the watts per kilo? On this Higher horse. than a human. I don't know. Okay. But <laughs> they're like 450, 500 kilos and their VO, their VO2 would be huge, man. Their VO2 would be huge. 
Yeah, Benji, uh, Luke just said that Wasp Killer, one horsepower. <laughs> Fuck off. Very good. That's how Luke is banned. Per horse. One <laughs> horsepower, horsepower per only. horse. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he's going well. And then I'm going to be doing the before off lander strip. I'm going to do the uh, a threshold plan on join. So once I get back in Andorra, I got that threshold plan ready to load up. And so you can follow me on Strava doing that uh, as well as join. You can follow people on join, but I'll be doing that but join plan. So I'm keen for that. Why are you doing this? Why are you training? Why are you training? Like I was worse than we you. We have to do 190 to k's in a day. Mate, I'm the one that needs to catch up. You're fine. I'm not. What, 190 k's, k's in a day? day? Could be cold. 190 in a day? Yeah. What do you mean 190 in a day? We have to do 190 k's in one of the days. And that includes like the climbs around. Oh, no. Told you this. I swear I looked up Flo on the Ant Challenge. The three day one is 75 k's, 190, 140. And the 140 has got the steep hills. I'm getting fucked. <laughs> so it's not. Oh, it was 90. <laughs> no, it's 190. That's like the seven fuck? hours. Plus. For, for hours. you? That's 14 yeah. for me. We'll be out there all day. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll have to put lights on my bike. Well, yeah, we should do that anyway. Uh, people want to send us lights. Uh, anyway, that's that's our first edition of the weekly show. We really, really hope you enjoyed it. Open to feedback on the format, but uh, it's good to talk about different topics, previews, recaps of the smaller races. We've got a lot of racing coming up this week, so we'll see you next week, same time, with a recap of all those races we mentioned, as well as any other ad hoc news uh, along the way. Until then, 